So I'm very thankful and very lucky to have had John Williams on board for today's podcast. John Williams, highly respected, highly acclaimed and best-selling author of two books, Screw Work, Let's Play and Screw Work, Break Free. And as both those book titles suggest, there's definitely this element of kind of play, discovery and fun in pretty much everything that I've seen John do through these, his company, The Ideas Lab. The Ideas Lab has literally helped thousands of people come up with different concepts and innovations, things they've either brought into their own company or to launch new businesses themselves. And we go into some detail in this podcast about how to not just come up with ideas and not just about ideation, but how to actually test those contents, uh, concepts and make sure they're kind of roadworthy, make sure they are legitimate business-worthy concepts. And John gives us his kind of five-step formula. Formula is probably the wrong word, kind of five components that uh, a concept needs to have to have real business viability. Uh, and they're, they're things that everybody can follow. Now, all of John's principles are very much kind of lean startup approach or MVP, MVP approach, minimum viable product. And as such, these sort of techniques and ideas are within reach of all of us. And you don't need a million pounds worth or a million dollars worth or startup funding to get going. And pretty much everything about John's work is about get going, getting some early traction and, and taking this idea somewhere. Just leaving this idea in your pocket isn't going to do anybody any good. So I think you'll get a lot of enjoyment, a lot of benefit from this podcast. Uh, I've certainly enjoyed hosting it with John. As we join the podcast, John's telling us a little bit about his very broad and very varied background and talks a little bit, a little bit about working at Avid Studios. They forgot they were an innovation company and, uh, and now then they're kind of also around. Uh, so I worked in that field and then I, went, I, worked as a, I became a senior managing consultant in Deloitte. I was in an internet startup for a couple of years before that. And, um, and then I decided I would always be interested in psychology and psychotherapy and um, creativity and stuff like that and how the mind works. And so I started studying, um, I think it was while I was at Deloitte, I can't remember, but I, was, I started studying um, in counseling and then in humanistic psychotherapy. And then I qualified as a coach and started running these live events. I did a stand up comedy course. I got oh, a bit of music. That. Yeah. Had a bit of music played on the radio uh, all around the world. I did a couple of other wacky projects. And, um, and then out of becoming a coach and helping creative people with their careers and running this live event, Scanners Night in London, that got a lot of press and coverage and became very popular, um, I got offered a book deal by Pearson. Well, basically, it was a, we got into a conversation and I made a pitch and they said, yes, we want it. And that was the start of a what's now the world well, as the first of three books. Yeah. You're working on the third book as we speak. Is that right? Well, yeah, I actually kind of, um, I can't say too much about it at the moment because it's not been officially announced, but it, it's coming out of the summer. Um, and it's, uh, I worked on it in Thailand. So I, I went to Thailand for a month and uh, basically worked on it there just before all the coronavirus stuff kicked off or well, while it was. That's the most places. Yeah. 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 Yes, not, Actually, I do think there's um, your environment really helps, mm. actually. Um, we've certainly found that. Um, so the thing I really want to focus on most, at least be the start of our sort of discussion today, is around this area of investigation. So, so this series is really about innovation, investigation, and then initiation. And if we wander off that a little bit, that's totally fine. So with the, you know, the Ideas Lab, you know, people are coming to you, they're kind of brainstorming using other exercises with you to come up with concepts. How do people then, and how do you yourself investigate concepts to decide on which ones to drop, which ones to pursue and, and go forward with? I think that process gets easier over time. So the, the way you operate at the beginning is not the same as the way I operate or you operate, for instance, you know, as experienced entrepreneurs. At the beginning, the criteria for, for what idea to choose, I would suggest is kind of, I wrote, uh, um, I mean, a couple of my books are about that. Screw it, let's play, and screw it, break free. But I wrote <clears> that there's kind of five elements you want um, that 
make a really good idea. And when you get those all in place, when, it, when you know you've got a winner. And uh, the first one is you have to have, it has to excite you. It has to be some energy around it. You have to follow the energy to a certain extent. Um, because if you're just doing it because everyone else says it's the way to go and it makes money, if you're not excited by it, it just won't work because you'll be competing against somebody who is. And then, but you, clearly that's not enough. So the dreamers who just go do what, do, uh, do what you love and the money will follow. It's like, well, maybe, maybe it won't. So that's just the first element. Then what you need is you need to bring some element of genius. You need to bring some assets you have, which give you a competitive advantage. So often what people do when they leave their former career, like when I left technology and I left software, I thought, well, I'll never do that again. Down, you know, I'll walk away from all my tech skills and it will be completely irrelevant now. And in actual fact, what I found is it is a massive competitive advantage to be, uh, you know, I find technology easy. So uh, you can point me to anything. And I enjoy working out how you use something unless it's, got a very bad user interface, in which case I'm also quite in, intolerant <laughs> of like, it's just yes. badly designed, but otherwise I can get my head around anything and I like it. So, um, I think what people should do is not necessarily throw away everything you've used before. It, and, and bear in mind, but you, you can do that if you want to, but if you do, it has a high cost. So if you say like, you, you, you know, my previous career was this and now I'm going to do something completely unrelated. You can. You can go from being a commodities broker to a stand-up comic, but you better budget six years for it or something like that. Now, if you've got a natural talent and you've always been making people laugh, that gives you a competitive advantage to some extent, but there's no substitute for getting on stage and doing gig after gig. So when I was doing, when I, because I mentioned I did a stand-up comedy course, when I did it, the people who broke through were the people who were literally going, doing a gig every single night and then often driving out of London and going to the next city to do another gig so they could get the, the number of gigs up. And those are the people who you eventually saw, <clears throat> combined with a certain amount of raw talent, who, who broke through and ended up on TV. So Marek Larwood, uh, people who don't know the British comedy scene, would be meaningless, but uh, uh, there's a couple of other people who've named, I've forgotten, the Welsh chap who, turns up on uh, comedy panels. But those people all were just doing sh stuff a lot. So so I say that you have to be practiced at what you're doing. You have to, otherwise it's going to take a while. So that's something to bear in mind. And then the third element is value. And you have to, you have to use what you love and what you're good at in a way that creates value for people. Now, it seems blindingly obvious, right? But people forget it. They go like, well, I'm really good at this and I really enjoy it. You go, yeah, but do people want it? So value is the test where now it's instead of it's about you, it's about the other person. And, you know, the classic thing is can you solve a problem? And I've written quite a lot about this kind of stuff. Um, uh, but people go, oh, yeah, solve a problem. But they don't do it. They don't understand what that really means. What a problem mm -hmm. really means is mm -hmm. you have to, this is why my experience in counseling psychotherapy is so helpful, you have to tune into the other, pe other person's head and their life, and you have to inhabit what it's like. Because they go like, I help, this is the expert industry is often particularly bad at this. They go, I help uh, people achieve their dreams. It's like, okay, could you be a bit more vague? Uh, or I help women 30 to 50. By the way, that's everybody. I mean, that's not a niche. But it's, sorry, it can be a bit kind of dismissive sometimes. But 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 then I, you know, when I work with clients, I kind of I might make fun of their niche and then like tell them how to fix it. So if you know it, it, what we really need to look at is somebody who's sitting there thinking like this is driving me crazy. Like I've got to do something about this. You know, your previous uh, area was divorce. And it's like, yeah. what's it like when you're going through divorce? And what are the worries? What are the hopes? What are the dreams? What gets you up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat? That's the stuff that people will pay money to solve. And so that's what hitting that value element really means. And the other two elements are, that, um, one is story. So the story you spin around what you're doing matters. You know, the fact that my, my, uh, this first book, Screw It, Let's Play, um, the publisher wanted to call Escape the Nine to Five, which is a perfectly functional title, but it's boring mm. as crap. 
So they say, you know, people might misunderstand what it's about because it's not about not working. It's not about, you know, sitting on the beach drinking cocktails, but it says that on page one. So, um, it, and the subtitle tells you it's how to do what you love and get paid for it. So uh, I pushed to ha- keep that title because it was shocking enough 10 years ago. Now it's fairly tame to use the screw mm-hmm. word. Um, and uh, that really played a big part in it becoming notorious and, 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 and raising. I've always liked the book title. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think you, yeah. it, but so the spin you put on something really matters. Um, and then finally, the, the element is, um, I can't remember if I called it money or what, but, but basically it's do the numbers work. Are people willing to pay for this? And can you deliver it at scale in a way where, you know, it's not going to kill you? So for instance, people go like, oh, I'll, I'm going to make hand, I'm going to hand make handbags out of leather or something like this. They come up with a kind of handmade product and then they sell them for a hundred pounds and they go, well, how long is it taking you to make these? two days they go and well, now you're getting paid 50 pounds a day and that's less that's before we take out the the, the costs of yeah. materials which is significant yeah. and now you're below minimum wage and they go oh yeah and and uh, there's a lot of entrepreneurs anyone, working below minimum wage yeah right really and is. and now really to anyone is. who's financially savvy that's like well mm. what kind of idiot would do that but but actually create i used to do that creative people don't think about money first so when you've got all those elements in place, then suddenly it doesn't mean magically, you know, money falls out of the sky, but it means that you it's kind of like the um, the elements in a tumbler lock or something where you're unlocking them one by one. And when you do that, now you've got something. Now you can throw ads at it. Now you can do all that clever list building SEO stuff, which actually is fairly generic. The hard work is unlocking that combination of of five elements and and that particularly the value element which people underestimate is what's known in the startup world as product market fit and that would be worth talking about um a, a bit perhaps yeah we'll move on to that i just want to touch on something there's a series on netflix at the moment i think it's called the hundred humans i don't know if you've uh, stumbled across this i think it'd be up your street yeah. actually it's kind of yeah. human psychology i haven't watched there's it, an I've episode seen it in there yeah there's an episode there, um, and they've got 100 people, and they've done as best they can to make them a diverse backgrounds, religions, etc. And they put 50 people in one classroom, and they put into small groups, and their goal was to build a tower and make this tower as high as possible without spaghetti and marshmallows, right? And there was a prize. There was a going to earn, I think, $400 if their little team uh, became the highest. And did exactly the same experiment with another group. So again, 50 people, exactly the same rules, with no financial incentive at all. And what they found is the the classroom, if that's the right phrase, with the financial incentive was very quiet. They were very studious. They were very focused. Um, whereas the other room was noisy, was collaborative. People were speaking. And they weren't sort of scared of trying things. And they massed the, the team without, or the classroom without any financial incentive, massively outperformed yeah. the financial yeah. team. So that's one of the things I really like about the book title and the whole kind of premise, really, about this play element. Mm. And yeah. basically, and they then in the program, they then moved on to a sort of expert to investigate deeper why this phenomenon happened. And he basically said, yes, if you give people a sort of financial incentive, people tend to inhibit their thinking, not think creatively. They're scared about losing their team the money by not winning. So they, yeah, they actually get less creative. Um, if it was a envelope stuffing contest, the financial element would have worked because it doesn't require a lot of creativity. So, you know, it's all about this sort of play idea. And uh, for me, the intrinsic by reference, the idea of fun in mm. some of the, the courses and stuff that you do. I know you've got like a five-day challenge. And even, you know, again, just the wording alone, it, it creates this, at least the way I interpret it, this, you know, play, fun, creative kind of element, which I think is really beneficial, particularly in those early days where you're looking for innovations and something new. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's really interesting. I've seen similar things with what's called the marshmallow test. And I think you've you've got to enjoy it, and it's got to be um, 
fun. Otherwise, like I say, you just you, you, the, the point of the, the ultimate. De- I mean, there's multiple meanings to the word play. I was talking to uh, my men's group last night about this because the new title of the book is there's a new book coming out and it's got quite a strong. <laughs> and and I was saying like, I was going to give it away. Then <laughs> am I going to get killed? And um, and we talked about the word play and the the first book. And I said that there's multiple meanings to the word play, but ultimately. The, the the top one is you can't force somebody to play. Like if you put a gun to someone's head and say play, whatever they do is not playing anymore, right? They're doing it because you told them to. So the point of play is it's always a choice. But beyond that, it also encapsulates this, this thing. It's become a bit of a, a corporate buzzword, but playing it out. And it's a really important concept. So people say like, you know, they start banning all these words that you can't use. Like some, some people are saying unprecedented has become a cliche during the coronavirus crisis. Well, what else are you going to call it? That's what the word means. It's, it is unprecedented, well, at least in the last 100 years. So um, in in terms of play, that willingness to play it out is really fundamental. And I, I was on a course once. I've done lots of self-improvement courses. I did something called Insight. I don't know if you've ever heard of that one. It's a little bit like yes. Landmark, and it comes yes. from the same family tree, which comes from Est. You know, there's some dodgy stuff further yes. up that tree. <laughs> Est was a, a strange hardcore, moment. And so it was pretty hardcore. People locked people in a room until they sort of, you know. That was back in control. the 70s, though, I think, right? Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. apparently, you know, the same people kind of filtered down and created some slightly more palatable versions. But I did this thing called Insight, and they did this amazing test. And they, they said, okay, all of you, I've got however many matches, like you've got uh, 27 matches, you know, normal matches you use for lighting a cigarette. And you've got to make nine squares out of 27 matches or something like, you know, those kind of things that go, how many yeah, squares yeah. can you make? Yeah. Uh, or some tests like that. And they said, like, what, what the rule is basically once you've sussed it, once you've worked out how to do it, um, get up and go and help other people. But the way you help them is very specific. Um, when they do something right, you say nothing. And when they do something wrong, you, you just say the word no. And that's it. That's your help. So you, what, what happens is a few early people twig this puzzle and they work out how to do it okay. and they stand up and you have this experience as somebody who hadn't worked it out of sitting there and there's these people, you're sitting on the floor, right? And there's these people standing over you looking at you trying to do the puzzle, which is a little bit stressful, and they just shout no every so often. (laughs) And what happens, though, is absolutely fascinating because when you eventually twig what the answer is and you get up and go to help, your experience then is standing over somebody sitting on the floor, and all they have to do to get the answer is get a matchstick and just do this and put it in every possible combination of places. Because event, you're just going to go, no, 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 silence. No, 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 silence. And you'll crack the puzzle in 30 seconds. What do people actually do? They sit there and they, they, they you know, with the matchstick in their hand and do nothing. And they, just like you were saying with the, the people rewarded by money in that experiment, yeah. they do absolutely nothing waiting to find the right answer. And all these people, and, and when you're standing over them and you go like, I know what the answer is. Why are you not doing anything? It's an amazingly powerful experience. And basically, the, the, that's the model of entrepreneurship. So when I see people sitting down thinking about what idea to pursue uh, for more than a day, <laughs> um, then you're wasting your time. Because what you should be doing is you playing out your ideas in the world. So instead of you sitting, you know, here's the world outside and you're sitting at home thinking about things and maybe this will work, maybe this will work. I'll go and Google it. So I screw that. Go and talk to people and interact. So in order to find good ideas, if you think, let's take the example of Scanners Night. I would like to meet other people who are scanners, these creative people, lots of ideas like me who find it difficult to focus and talk about what it's like. So what I did was I put a notice on Barbara Scher's bulletin board. I don't know think those things still exist. Uh, this is like 2011 or something. Saying, if anyone wants to meet in London, uh, we're going to meet at the ICA bar 
uh, th- this date and this is who I am. I mean, no, not that I had any kind of profile at the time, but you know, um, I'm interested in it. This is what, who, this is what I do for a living. And, uh, we had six people turn up. One of them was a friend. One of them was a client who I was, I was coaching people at the time and then four randoms. And uh, we sat there and had a drink and we talked about being a scanner and we compared our scanner notebooks because we all had notebooks full of billions of ideas and we loved it. Right. That grew into an event that, that had up to 80 people in one room and ended up being covered by a Daily Mail, a Daily Express, Red Magazine, and multiple other magazines without me even going out to the press to attract them. They were just fascinated by it. So that is the model that you should pursue for ideas. It's like, how do I go and I want to do this? I think this thing should exist. What's the minimum viable product, which I'm sure people have heard the t- this kind of concept before. And the MVP for a live event is six people in a bar in London for free. And you, if necessary, you have to, you have to strong arm your mates to turn up. So you're not sitting on your own looking like a plonker. And as long as you do that, you've got your insurance. Cause if the worst case scenario would be me and my friend Liz, you know, and nobody else, it's like me and Liz have a drink and talk about being a scanner. We survived, you know, nothing terrible happened. Yeah. So this is how you find ideas. Get off your ass and go and try things. Should we end? There? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of <laughs> concepts around sort of failing fast and not being, you know, no fear mm-hmm. of failure. And I think that comes back to the matchsticks example, right? You're trying to intellectualize it uh, and not look silly by you don't want to get shouted at. No, be shouted at. And as you say, the answer is just to try a hundred things, and even if it's a hundred thing, you'll get there pretty quick. Um, yeah, yeah, and I don't think even this. Now, there's a difference between the kind of businesses you and I like to start and, the, I don't know, maybe some of the, yours have been a bit more high investment, but there's usually a way to start a business with minimal investment so the risk is actually trivial. The risk is mostly your time and maybe a bit of, you know, uh, pride. But apart from that, it, it you're not putting – you shouldn't have to put your house on a line. You know, um, but even with big, I mean, my uncle, uh, my grandfather started a motor body uh, repairer's business. But the way he started was he, he liked cars and he was good at fixing cars. And he fixed his own car on the drive. And then he fixed friends' cars. And then he hires somebody else because he's got more work and he knows what to do. And, and then he ends up, you know, 25 years later with a premises in Birmingham with multiple staff. And my mum's the, you know, co director. And it's like, everything you'd imagine with a big business and spray bakes they have to invest in and laser jigs and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, but it starts with my granddad on the drive. So almost every business, it's difficult sometimes with tech startups, but even then with a tech startup, can you lash together current systems to prove something works and people to prove the need before you invest the money to make the product? So can you lash together with Zapier and some other, you know, yeah. sales force and whatever tape. else it is. Sticky tape and rubber bands. I've heard it yeah. described as, as Flintstoning, where, you know, the Flintstone is after the Flintstone car. It looks like a car on the top, but underneath you're just running along. And yeah. if, for anyone who's ever been in the software world, when you go to an exhibition and they demo the new version of software, we literally once demoed the previous version of software and told them it did things it didn't do because it wasn't quite working the day before. So, I mean, it's, that's actually not a bad way of operating. Is I mean, point, point blank lying is not a good idea. But if you can lash it together in a way where it operates how you want it to operate, but behind the scenes it's elastic and rubber band, that's fine. Because what you can prove also, is that people like it. And also, I think there's other ways you can test a concept without even building the prototype. For you know, if we were talking, uh, you know, you could put together a landing page for this thing which doesn't exist yet, and you can put a yeah. fake screenshot of what the item is and say, "Would you buy this? It's ten dollars." And yeah, and um, I have done this a couple of times, and it was you know a functioning sales page, if you like. People click on the ten dollar button, and it would then say, "Actually, this product isn't developed yet." But if it was interest, please let you put your name and email address. It will confirm that this is, you know, has some um, value, and we'll also let you know if we go ahead with it. 
And that was a pretty unbiased way to get genuine idea of interest. Not yeah. not perfect, I would say. I don't think anything is perfect because you've got to get, you know, you've got to pay for some adverts and get that in front of people when even if someone clicked on it, doesn't mean they'd really have purchased it. You know, it, it's, yeah. it, it's, but it's, but it's enough, certainly man. an indicate. Yeah, it's an indicating factor for sure. Buffer I did mean, it. I, Buffer went from yeah. idea to first paying client in something like six weeks. So Buffer is the social media scheduling tool. And famously, Dropbox, the MVP for Dropbox, were, the minimum viable product, was actually a video explaining how cool it would be once it was released. And so it didn't exist at all. But people shared it a lot because it had lots of jokes um, about memes that were going around at the time. It's, it's pretty old now. But uh, people shared it partly because it had all these in-jokes about the startup world. And, and that was – so I think you can do that. And for most of us, particularly people in the expert industry, just run a webinar or something. So if you want to you want to test uh, an idea or you want to test a niche, run a campaign around a free thing like a webinar or a free challenge or whatever, whatever it might be, a free training or something. And if people show a lot of interest, then you go, okay, this seems like there's some, you know, there's there's a lot of demand here. Mm. And uh, I remember someone telling me a story about, uh, I forget the details of it, but basically two sales guys go to a country, I can't remember which country it is, and their their job is to sell shoes. The first salesman phones back to the head office, go, go fly me back. Why? What's wrong? Nobody wears shoes here. This is an absolute disaster. What the hell are you sending me here for? It's a total joke. Pointless waste of time. Send me back. And of course, the second sales guy phones up and says, this is frigging amazing. Send everybody. Because nobody's wearing shoes here. So um, <laughs> there's different ways to interpret the same feedback. Um, mm. and, even, and, and there's a lot being talked about sort of digital data. And, and my experience is, as a, you know, uh, running relatively small businesses, is that I, I mean, it's still about interpretation. And we can really get things massively wrong through our interpretation of what that data can be. So it can be dangerous. It sounds like, oh, it's an obvious thing to do. Going back to your point, I would swap 10,000 surveys about a business concept for yeah. two or three guys in a room with a beer to get, uh, not everybody, I have to say, I've got a few sort of go-to people that I think will give me this feedback, good, positive, or negative, uh, back, which will help me. Even if I don't know the industry, it's just it's a certain personality type. Um, and one of the questions I like to ask people, I don't know if you've used this, I learned this question from Mike Harris. If people don't know, uh, he's a fairly successful guy, uh, launched three uh, companies in a row that all went to a billion plus evaluation. Uh, uh, what's the first banking? It's Egg. Egg uh, oh, banking yeah, yeah. online. Yeah. I met him at that first event, but probably where you met him. And I went up and shook his hand and said, oh, I, I just got to say thank you because I'm a first direct customer. I was a Mercury Communications yeah. customer and I was an Egg yeah. customer. <laughs> okay. So he said, oh, all right. Yeah, he yeah. was actually a mentor of mine for about six months. So it was great to work with him. Mm. And one of the questions he used to ask people was, or try, yeah, was why will this never work? So he gave an example. Someone told him, uh, uh, egg bank, this will never work. Well, okay, why would it never work? It will never work because it costs 22 pounds to acquire a new banking customer and you're only going to earn X amount out of them. It's just the numbers don't work. And that was exactly the information he needed. Okay, so just need to come up with a crazy name for a bank so it stands out and it gets attraction and we could massively influence that figure. And they were, I don't know the numbers now, but they were acquiring a person for six pounds in marketing spend as opposed to 22, which was the banking norm. Yeah. Um, but getting that, why it will never work, often gets you to the crux of the thing you've got to solve. I, in my experience, that every industry has an inherent challenge. And if you don't know it, yeah. then don't go there because <laughs> you're going to spend a lot of money and time and effort to work out what it is, I think. Um, yeah, I, I think um, the point of an MVP, I've heard it described, is to test assumptions. So people think, mm. it, first of all, there's a really important point for anybody who hasn't started a business yet. What, they, what I often see people doing, I just wrote this in a new book and it, and it involved a swear word, um, but it, 
because uh, those were <laughs> the only way of expressing it. But people often, when they start out, they just go, "I'm going to put this out there and see if it works." And I go, "Like, no, 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 that's not how entrepreneurs do it. You have to put something out into the world and decide that it is effing well going to work. You're going to do whatever it effing takes to make it work." I think was what I wrote. And um, now it may still fail, but you go at it like your life depends on it and you have faith in it. And if it turns out, despite all your best efforts, everyone just goes like, no, then now you have to pivot and you have to do something else. You have to modify it in some way at least. But the, the idea that you just go like, well, maybe it will work and let's see, that's the wrong kind of uh, energy uh, to go with it. And um, I like your story of egg because I do think ha having names and having a hook and having a, that's that story element I talked about, which is the penultimate mm. one of five. And I think it can make a massive difference between you having to slog to get noticed among all the noise because every market is crowded and actually attracting stuff to you, which I've, you know, I've attracted loads of press over the years. Yeah, Johnny, I've always said that every product needed to have a story. You know, what is a product story? And that's kind of why does it need to exist? You know, we've created this because, and, you know, it's the because which is important. Um, there was another um, another phrase kind of still from Mike Harris, because, I again, one I really latched on to, and it's been with me ever since, is, and it very much goes to what you're just talking about, is go for something like your life depended on it, knowing that it doesn't. And yeah. I really like that fine balance between all that energy that comes from, you know, your life depends on it, but all the freedom that comes from actually at the end of the day, it doesn't in my life. It, and I am, will survive if yeah. it doesn't happen. Um, you, you have to, it's a real, it you're all. Yeah. And I think it's really important as well as a, particularly as a beginning entrepreneur to decouple your self-esteem from your results. Now, it's difficult because in a way, there's no doubt my self-esteem went up when I had a book that was translated into 10 languages and, and other things. And, and you see yourself in the press repeatedly. It definitely helps. But I know I have to – It's a guy, one person I heard it uh, describe it as, like, don't, don't hard link your self-esteem to your bank balance because that really that's really not good. And then you can't function because you have a bad month and you feel like you're a terrible person. And then you don't feel like working, which can't, you know, doesn't help you to, to solve the problem. So you've got to somehow keep some separation between the two. And I, what I say in, you know, pretty much all my books is if you, if you absolutely determined that you will not stop, you decide I'm going to be an entrepreneur and I'm going to make a living, a good living, whatever happens. And I'm willing to be flexible about how that happens you absolutely will get there. So you need to be able to pivot and you need to be, you need to iterate around multiple versions of, of what you're uh, working on, what you're creating. Yeah. I mean, I'm a, I'm a football fan. I, I don't think you're a football guy, right? No, not really. <laughs> I don't watch but, any but, sport whatsoever, I'm afraid. Oh, okay. Well, this analogy is not going to work for you, but I'll, I'll stick with it anyway. Um, I use it with football because I'm a football fan, but it works for any sport. And I think this is just my own thing. I, I feel like business is a game of football. So I go on that field of play and I go for every tackle, go for every header, I sprint for every ball, I go for every cross, I, you know, pass it. I'm trying to do everything I can. And of course, I'm trying to win that game. However, I think, and I really think there's a valid point here, the difference between the really excellent football players or whatever sport is and the less good ones is if they come off that field and they've been fresh, they've come off the field 4-0, even though they've done everything, yeah, they're going to be downhearted, they're going to have to dust themselves off. But next Saturday, they go back on that pitch and they're going to run for every ball just as hard, you know, if not even harder. And I feel business is like that. And I've definitely had some kicks along the, my journey, for sure. And, and they are not easy. I found some of them really pretty friggin' tough and I'm being polite. Um, so that for me, that little analogy is okay, you know, yeah. shot of gin or whatever it might need, and go back out there and, and run just as hard. Uh, and that's yeah. the skill or determination that I think you've got to go into it, you know. And you get that, I think, from being if you're only surrounded by friends who work 
in jobs and have never been an entrepreneur, they won't understand that because they, they, the, the, the way entrepreneurship works is not how people imagine it before they get into it, unless your parents are entrepreneurs. So a lot of successful entrepreneurs, their parents were entrepreneurs um, for that reason, because it works. So entrepreneurship works how humans work naturally. What we did during the Industrial Revolution is turn everybody into a cog in a machine and then create an education system which matches and, a, and an employment system which says, you know, stay there and do what we told you. And though both the education system and, and the experience of most jobs is 180 degrees opposite to all the skills and mindset you need as an entrepreneur because there's no pass or failure as an entrepreneur. I mean, yes, you can go bust, but I mean, like most of the businesses we're talking about and the people listen to this are not running, you know, giant corporations of a hundred staff, which are, which are much a whole different skill set. We're talking about just, can you do something useful people at scale that makes you a great living doing something you care about and enjoy. And that is not actually that hard a goal to reach um, if you're determined to do it. Uh, so, I mean, like, it, it's, it's, it's always doable, in my opinion. Uh, but if you follow the – if you go into it with the mindset of an employee, you're guaranteed to fail because an employee either gets the job or they don't. They either pass the exam or they don't. They either got into the university they wanted or they didn't. But entrepreneurship doesn't work like that. You launch something with great fanfare and everyone just goes, and then you change it slightly or you change the market or whatever else it is. And suddenly everyone just goes, oh my God, this is brilliant. And now you've got a business. So you just keep yeah, iterating until the damn thing works or pivoting if necessary, which is, you know. That's a totally different mindset. I mean, it's, it's night and day. And I, I think that was probably the longest thing that took me to get when I moved away from the, the regular job. Uh, was this whole different, yeah, just 180 degree different way of thinking. Going back to my regular job, before, and I think I was, yeah, I was there before I kind of quit and did my app, my first app business. Um, I used to do the designs, product and graphic design for HRP, which are historic royal palaces. So if you're in the UK and you go to Tower of London or all the, the big royal palaces, you probably see some of my stuff. And every Monday, we'd have this kind of business meeting about all the product sales. You know, obviously, it's all sort of touristy stuff, you know, T-shirts and stuff, but some pretty good stuff there. Um, and we would know, like, oh, well, why didn't they, that T-shirt sell in that store? And we'd go to the store and we'd go, the, the, the bulb went out. The bulb <laughs> went out that lit up that shelf. I mean, it had a physical monetary change on the spreadsheet. And it was every single Monday, something, you know, of course, there'd be a few things. It all pretty much always find what we believe was the cause, you know, sometimes a little bit more, you know, oh, they moved it from that corner to that corner. We raised the price by 50p and sales dropped off a cliff. And what we found was if you get it just right, the difference between just right is and just a little bit wrong is massive. It's not that, oh, you get 1% less sales. No, it's like you'll get 200% sales just by getting the price just right. And sometimes the price had to go up, not down. It wasn't just about yeah. cheaper. And, and, uh, and that was a really, I never would have believed that. And it was a really strange lesson to learn. I never would have believed that was the case had I not gone through that experience myself. Yeah, and I so think if, that's the other thing that, that the, you do need, if you're doing online marketing, for instance, as we do, you do need some expert input at some point um, to get the online stuff right. It's kind of easier in person because you, can, you, can, you get real live uh, feedback. Yeah. Um, but if you're, uh, if you're online, you, you know, I coach people, on some of my courses, I run this thing called the, the Pioneer Program, where people work for three months to launch their business. And often they'll go like, well, I put it out there and it, and it didn't work and I've got no interest and they feel really despondent. And I go, well, can you just show me what you posted? And they look at it and I go like, well, this word here is going to put everybody off. And unfortunately, it, it does sometimes come down to things like that, like, or your link, you, people couldn't see the link and they didn't realize yet. You made them go search for the link rather than, click on it. And, and we know as online marketers, but that will, you know, you can shake off about three different errors. Minor things will shake off 30% of your audience. 
to the point where, you know, you've lost a third, you've lost a third, you've lost a third, now there's pretty much nothing left. Or a really bad error, you know, you'll lose 90%. And, and, and so you fix those things and you tweak all those things and suddenly something you thought was not working starts working. And that yeah. partly comes from experience, but also having some sort of marketing or business coach input. Yeah, I think, and it's also having a little bit of uh, ability to kind of step back because it's a very emotional subject. If you just created your own beast, you know, it's like your baby and of course you want everyone to love your baby and to take a step back and go, you know, was the light switch plugged on? Was the light bulb in? You know, the equivalent of that uh, is really, really important. And so don't get too hard. Do investigate those things. Now, I'm just yeah. a little bit aware of time. I think you need, you've got another appointment. Um, yes. Is that right? Uh, yeah. So what should we wrap up? And then I can um... – I, I've actually just slacked my, my assistant. I've just sent him a message on Slack. So he's okay to wait a few minutes. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, I guess we'll sort of wrap this up then. Okay. Um, so I understand you've still got your five-day challenges uh, taking place. Is that right? I know you're sort of famous for these challenges. Yeah. I used to run uh, a paid thing called the 30-day challenge before everybody ran one of those. And um, uh, back in 2011, we started and we had – 1100 or 12 no 1300 people go through that and uh and those are paid things and those are great fun now what i've done is i've taken that and condensed it into a five-day thing which is free where we delve into all this kind of stuff um we've been talking about but in a less theoretical level so uh you instead of just talking about like here's the idea of what makes a good idea we basically you say this is my idea and i you know we will look at it and and tell you whether it's going to work or not and how to improve it and get you going out there and checking it and launching something. Even if you've got a business already uh, and you want to launch something new, like an online course or something, or you're starting off at the beginning and trying to work out what you could put out into the world that could really work. Uh, we help you do that in five days. I'm available for the whole time. It's a lot of fun. We had a thousand people on the last one and they're kind of growing. There was 500 people before. So we're looking at getting, um, well, we'll see how far. So we you're delivering go. that via webinar, sort of live webinar interactions. We do it in Facebook. It? So we do, it in, uh, okay. you, if, if you go to the ideaslab.org and look for, um, a link to register for the, the next five day challenge, we've got one coming up, uh, it depends when this goes out, but we, we, we're doing, we're probably going to do them regularly now. Um, so it's worth signing up to just hear about the, the next one. And we run them in Facebook and uh, there's a very video lessons from me. I mean, I go live in the group every day. I, I was in a Facebook live and I just answer questions for an hour with no kind of, you know, just off the cuff, which I love doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I, and I've not been, I've not attended one of those, but I imagine the sort of the community aspect of it mm. is very, very helpful, like emotionally. Uh, and you can get it is, say, it's, it's it's like a feedback and yeah. Yeah, I love them, and that's why I've always liked. I mean, I remember when I was a teenager, and I discovered that f throwing parties was rather good fun. And <laughs> it, I feel like my work is the challenges, whether it was the the old paid ones or the new free ones. They're a little bit like uh, like throwing a party. I mean, you you're trying to do something, but there's a there's a real energy about them. So that's why I love them. Fantastic. Okay, so look. John, it's been absolutely awesome and uh, really enjoyed. I love this sort of subject, so I can talk about it for, for hours on end, and I know you can. Um, yeah. No, any, like, anything else you want to say before we sign off? Um, no, but I mean, uh, there's never been a better time in history, even with the time of recording we're in lockdown, but there's never been a better time in history to start your own thing and launch something successful that you love doing that gets you paid and which provides real value in the world. So crack on yeah. with it. Couldn't agree more. Been a pleasure, sir. Mm, yeah. Uh, well, thanks for it there. We'll wrap it up there. Cool. Absolute pleasure. I look forward to hopefully chatting to you uh, in the not too distant future. It's been too long. Cheers.